Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the startup panel. Thanks for coming. Uh, today we have four great speakers from various startup-related uh, groups, businesses, organizations. And uh, they're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what it's like to be a startup and uh, work in that field. So the way this is going to work is I have a few questions prepared. But I also have volunteers who have passed out note cards and some pens per row. And if you have any questions during the panel, please go ahead and fill those out. Uh, write down the question, pass it to the side, uh, raise your hand or something, and a volunteer will come down and grab that card and run it down to me. And that way I can ask that question. So uh, let's start off with some introductions. Uh, if you guys want to just, I'll just introduce you a little bit and you can talk a little bit about what you do. So uh, all the way on the left here, uh, you're right, sorry. Uh, we have Dave Paola of Block. You want to go ahead? Howdy. Oh, yeah, uh, my name is Dave, and I'm doing a startup right now with um, three other U of I alumni. Uh, we are trying to change online education. We're running web development boot camps, and we're trying to teach people to code. Um, so we're based in San Francisco, and we're hiring. <laughs> So, uh, I don't okay. know. What? Right next to him, we have um, Mick Kulkarni of Do.com. Yep. Uh, hi, my name is Amit Kulkarni. Um, I originally started a startup in September of 2008 called Many Moon um, with three other people. Um, we bootstrapped the company for about a year, raised capital, did that for another year, and then we were recently acquired by Salesforce. But um, as part of that agreement, we're actually still running as a separate startup, similar to Heroku. So, we actually um, are now Do.com. It's a totally different startup, but we're also based in San Francisco. Thanks. Right next to him, we have Corey Levy of One. Hi, um, Corey Levy. I work for a startup company called One. Um, UIUC would be class of 2014. Um, and One is a, a mobile application that connects people around interest and location. Um, and prior to One, I worked at a couple of venture capital firms one in high school called the Founders Fund, and that was another couple UIUC graduates that started that. So, And finally, we have Dan Mangis of Braintree. Braintree is based in Chicago, and we help businesses accept credit card payments online. So we do the credit card processing for companies like GitHub, 37 Signals, and Living Social. Thanks. Uh, so the first question I'm going to start out with is, how important is funding to a startup, and how do you get it? Um, I know, Dan, here, you, you were more of the first engineer at Braintree. Um, did you have any involvement with, with the funding process? Um, yeah, so Braintree actually uh, decided to go the bootstrapping route initially and not raise any venture capital. Um, so for the first few years of the business, um, we really found ways to release our product. And along the lines, I'm sure many of you have you know, heard people talk about releasing a minimum viable product. Um, we went through a few stages where... Um, Brian Johnson, who founded the company, um, initially to start off on the business side of issuing merchant accounts and selling business services around credit card processing. Uh, we then um, landed a contract to release a product for uh, a vault-only solution, which a vault with credit cards refers to storing credit cards um, so that merchants can use them for repeat purchases. Um, so we released a vault-only product, and then we went on to build our full payment gateway. Um, so the road to bootstrapping was a little bit slower, but it gave us you know, complete autonomy over the company, um, kind of the freedom to build the business how we wanted to. And then a few years into it, we were profitable. The business was growing and doing very well. Um, we actually did decide to raise capital then and took a Series A investment of $34 million from Excel. Um, and at that point, you know, we decided that everything was going pretty well. We really wanted to expand uh, what the business was doing. So it really depends. Like the importance of venture capital depends on how you want to grow your business. There are ways that you can bootstrap your company, like Braintree did. And then, you know, for us, um, venture capital is a little bit, but we didn't take like any sort of like seed funding, and we were able to still grow a profitable and successful business. Cool. You can just pass it down. So, quick question: How many of you want to start a startup company and raise money? Raise your hand. Cool. So um, when we uh, started out, we did not think we needed to raise money um, because we didn't have any costs. Like we were in school, we had food, we had 
a place to live. Um, and we came out to San Francisco for one week and met with some uh, uh, entrepreneurs and investors out there. And there was one guy, his name was uh, Keith Raboy, and he's the COO of Square right now, and formerly, I think, was the COO of, of, of Slide with Max Levchin. And Keith saw what we were doing and said, um, you should always be raising money, even if you're not. And I think what, what raising money does is it, it A, allows you to um, uh, surround yourself with awesome people that are financially vested to help you, and then B, validation. So for people that you know, have never heard of you or if you're trying to, to, to hire or close a deal, having awesome people um, surrounding you is, is really helpful. So um, yeah, one thing Keith said to us was, um, uh, you should always be raising money, and things take longer than expected, and more money than required all of the time. So, um, and yeah, we we really value his 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 feedback, and he was right. So we ended up raising a seed round of financing a little over a year ago, um, a little over a million dollars from um, a bunch of really cool people like True Ventures and um, Charles River Ventures. Those guys were the first investors in Twitter. Um, so yeah, in short. I, th I think uh, the people that raise their hands, it's always uh, it's always good to do it for validation. So yeah, um, yeah, I think that's a really good point um, about raising money if you want to accelerate and grow your business fast. Um, I think raising money depends on what type of business you want to build. Um, we bootstrapped for a year primarily because the four of us had actually come from another startup that had raised twenty six million dollars, and it became super painful to sort of try to build a minimal viable product when you sort of have to pay back a lot of money. And so we started the business thinking that we're not going to deal with investors. We're just going to build something that we, would, we ourselves would want to use. So we built this productivity tool. The business was doing pretty well for a year, and it was growing, um, and it was profitable. I think the issue we had was we saw that there was a large opportunity in front of us. And when you're building a, uh, a small business, if, it, if the business was just there to support the four of us, I don't think we ever would have needed to raise capital. Um, but we saw that there was a large opportunity. We wanted to build something much bigger that could really impact the world, and for that, we needed capital. Um, so we raised uh, a round of uh, financing from a pretty prominent angel investor in the Bay Area, uh, Michael Deering, and that really helped us in a couple of ways. One, it gave us a capital to hire people, um, but two, it gave us sort of a, a network of people that we could now work with who had, who had been there and done that and had a lot of really good advice of things to do and things to avoid as we were uh, scaling the business. I think that answered the first question pretty well. <laughs> um, so I guess what I'd like to talk about is how to do it. Um, and I think a very popular analogy is it's a little bit in weird kind of quirky ways like dating. Um, how, do you, how do you find an investor? Can you hear me? No. Uh, yeah, so how do you find an investor? Uh, what is that process like? Uh, how long does it take? Um, do you have to be friends with them? Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, the, I think personally I've been incredibly privileged to be a part of the Illinois Network. Um, I tell a story very frequently about sitting in a coffee shop in San Francisco and I had a little, it was even upside down because I was an idiot and put it on wrong, but I had an Illinois alumni sticker on the back of my laptop. And I was sitting there hacking on some, don't remember what it was, but this 45-year-old guy walked up and he goes, are you an Illinois alum? I said, yeah. He goes, oh, what are you working on? It's like, oh, uh, I don't, some stupid little project. And he's like, oh, okay, well, here's my business card. I'm an, I'm an angel investor. You know, we should, we should connect sometime. Let's get coffee. <laughs> I was like, holy shit. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so, like, I think, I think, that, I think a big mistake that first-time entrepreneurs, even myself, uh, make a lot is to be hesitant to reach out to friends um, for introductions. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's the way it is almost always done. As soon as you get one investor and if they like you, They'll sort of intro you. This is actually a case where it's not dating is not a good analogy, <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, I think I think people are really hesitant to like reach out and try to sort of mine their network. Uh, but that's totally totally the best way to do it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. So so Dave, let me ask you: uh, after you get the business card, do you do you wait three days or do you just immediately? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's crazy to analyze that analogy too deeply, but yeah. It's surprisingly. So uh, let's let's take a step back real quick. We just talked about how to get funding and how why funding is important. But what made you all decide to do a startup? What was the the tipping point for that? <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, I don't know. I think uh, when I was when I was in high school, maybe uh, a lot of people don't like a lot of people don't like this book. But there's a book called Rich Dad Poor Dad, and I didn't do I know nothing about business really or numbers or um, not very good at math. Um, but this book very very easily explained the concept of assets versus liabilities and how you spend your money, um, which which led me to the conclusion, or rather, the book led me to the conclusion of um, mind your own business and how do you spend your time. Um, and I don't think there's anything more valuable than your time. Um, I think everybody dies, and how you spend your time between birth and death is the only thing that matters. Um, and if you are spending your time to benefit somebody else, um, that's charity, and that's fantastic. Um, but but given the choice of given the choice of working at a large company and getting a fraction of the return based on how much time you spend, versus working harder and getting a huge return based on how much you work. Um, that to me was a clear indication that startups are the right path for me. Um, there are other ways to do that besides startups. You could do, uh, this is a, an area where I think definitions kind of get muddied up. Is it a startup or is it a lifestyle business? Or, um, but the, the biggest factor for me is um, how effective you are in spending your time, really. So. Yeah, I think uh, for me, I'd actually work at a previous startup in product management and the main reason I started a business was I just finally wanted, I got to the point where I wanted to build what I wanted to build. I really didn't want to sort of take orders from other people and sort of follow through on their vision. Um, and I saw that there was a lot of, I mean, there's tons of opportunities every day in terms of what you want to build and ways to impact the world. And so we saw with sort of social networking like Facebook and Twitter that there was a huge opportunity for that in the business world. And I thought, that's something I want to build. It's something I'm passionate about and interested in, and I just want to do it. So, yeah. So, um, uh, growing up, and I'm sure it was the same for some of you all, most people when they graduate college, they go into the real world and then hate their jobs. And um, uh, after college, when, when you're in the real world working, you, know, you spend majority of your life working. And if you don't like your work, what's that mean? If you don't like your life. And like this was a quote, I forget, I forget who, who told me this, but if you spend majority of your time working and you don't like your work, then you know, you're not going to really live a happy life. So um, with, with, with doing a, your own company or your own startup, it you know, allows and gives you the opportunity to do something that, that you really enjoy doing every single day. So um, yeah, I think that you know, it was one, one of the, the main reasons that attracted me to, 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 to doing like a startup. But yeah. I think one interesting thing about startups is you just have a much bigger opportunity to actually um, make an impact on the world. And um, I mean, even at Braintree, like when you look at other actually tech startups and companies and people trying to start businesses, there's really two providers that every tech startup needs, and that's a hosting provider, and assuming the startup is trying to be profitable, a payments provider. Um, so at Braintree, you know, we've made accepting payments where there was just old legacy technology and not good options there. Um, whereas, you know, like on the hosting side, there's Amazon Web Services and other companies. But, you know, Braintree has been able to make accepting payments better for thousands of online businesses. And I think that's a sort of opportunity and impact that you have at a startup that you, you know, maybe don't have to the same degree at a more, like, mature, established company. Thank you. Um, let me remind you guys, if you have any questions, please write them down and raise your hand, and one of the volunteers will run it down. Um, so... After, after you've started the startup and you've gotten into it, kind of, how much time in the early stages is coding versus doing business and making connections and that sort of thing? Um, I just, I'm thinking like early, early stage, you have your founders. Do you guys actually spend a lot of time making the product or do you spend a lot of time talking to those angel investors and really making those kind of connections? Yeah, so for us at Braintree, I mean, network is going to, networking is going to be important, I think, regardless of your role or your company. Um, you know, if your business is going well, you're going to want to hire people. So you're going to want to network for that. You're going to you want to find people who are interested in using your product. Um, I had the fortune at Braintree to um, have a co-founder, Brian Johnson, who um, worked most of like business and sales and took care of those while I focused on building the technology with you know, a team of early engineers there. Um, so we split that you know, pretty well, where he focused on the business side as I focused on the engineering side. But I think you know, networking is going to be pretty important. Um, you know, clearly, you need to 
spend time actually writing code and building your product. But if you build a product and you know, have nobody using it, it's not going to be successful. Um, other way around, if you know, vice versa, if you uh, spend all the time talking about your product and never actually get it built and get it shipped, uh, that's not going to work well either. So uh, both are pretty important. Yeah, you brought up a, a really good point. I think, um, I think it's really important to do a mixture of both. And if you have, if you have a team surrounding yourself, um, uh, uh, there's no reason why you can't be doing both, working on your product all of the time and, and, and networking all of the time. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, one thing I actually tried to do was to um, break up my days. So I said basically, so there was four of us, um, three of the guys spent 100% of their time working on the product. Uh, and me, myself, what I did is I basically would try to do network, marketing, customer service, and a lot of that stuff from 8 a.m. to about 1 p.m. Um, and then from 1 p.m. until whatever, midnight, 2 a.m. was pure product. And so I just sort of said, I'm not going to do any meetings. I'm not going to do phone calls and stuff in the afternoon and evenings. I'm just going to be focused on the product. And I found that helped because it, um, it helped me when, I, when, when I'm working on the product, I just want to focus on the product. I don't want to be interrupted. And the thing with networking, it's great, but um, it can be a distraction at times. So time boxing helped a lot. Uh, so I know nothing about business. Um, I remember... The, <laughs> the, uh, I was doing a startup with somebody many of you may know, Samir Sandresh, about a year and a half ago, and we built basically what is Heroku for Python. And Heroku supports Python now, so obviously that's what happened there. Um, but I remember meeting with an investor, uh, with Samir, and this is the first time I'd ever met with an investor before, and he said, all right, so, so what's your two-year plan look like? And we were like, uh well, we have this thing that people kind of like. And he's like, yeah, so what are you going to do in a year? And I had no idea. I had no idea. I didn't even know what to say. Um, and so I think, I think it's very easy to say, what, what does it mean to do business, right? Uh, what's business versus, versus coding? And a lot of what we found at Block is we have one page on our website where we try to automate and give you know, visualizations and graphs of all the different kinds of aspects of business. How many applicants per day do we have? Um, how much revenue per class per month, you know? Um, and so doing business to me, I don't really, I don't really think about it that way. I think, I think there are a lot of like administrative things that you need to do, like accounting and making sure you have um, <laughs> more income than your expenses. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of, I kind of think doing business is a is a jargon that isn't isn't too accurate. It just doing business means providing value to somebody. So um, most of what I do there is code. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm rambling. Uh, so we have a few questions. Um, what do you guys think, what are, what are your thoughts generally on startup incubators? Uh, things like Y Combinator, Lightbank, Greylock Ventures, VC firms like that, I believe, is the uh, kind of general set consensus of what incubators are. So. Well, so I've never been through an incubator. Um, I, think, I think it's totally possible to be very successful without going through an incubator. Um, I think you know block block is profitable, which is uh, this is the first profitable company I've worked for with on um, yeah, so I don't know I mean I think it's I think it's obvious that if you go through for example Y Combinator, you have a huge advantage um, if nothing else, uh, marketing and advice from previous entrepreneurs I think that's the biggest value they provide and I think uh, Gary Tan said this on on Friday um, but if you have to, you should really take a take a hard look at who's running the incubator and what kind of access you have and what the quality of the network is. So, yeah, um, yeah I didn't do we didn't do an incubator either. But um, the one thing I think that's in really really important when you start a company is find other people who are starting a company around the same time as you, and just sort of stay in touch with them and have coffee with them because there are very very few people who will understand what you're actually going through um, every single day, and it's nice to bounce ideas off of them and sob and cry and laugh or whatever. Um, but incubators are nice because that's sort of like, it's like a, a ready-made mix of those people. So I had to spend a fair amount of time finding people who were starting companies and talk to them and setting up the time to talk to them. So incubators will save you a lot of time there. Yeah, so I'm a, I, I've never been through an accelerator and incubator before, um, but, I, but I'm a huge fan given uh, that I know a bunch of people that went through them. And uh, early on, uh, I, I, I sort of shadowed at Techstars during their second year of existence. So I think the top two are obviously Y Combinator, and then I'm biased, but Techstars. Um, and what those incubators allow you to do is um, 
essentially you get thrown into this network that everyone keeps talking about. Um, and you have a, a demo day after three months or at the very end of the program and you're literally presenting in front of a room of hundreds of investors. So it literally accelerates you know, your networking to this one day. Um, so I think that's, that's really, really valuable. But if you already have that network, then you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not valuable. So. Yeah, I'm really just going to throw out a plus one to these guys. Um, I mean, don't feel like you have to do it if you apply for an incubator and you don't get in. You know, don't feel like that's going to limit your chances to succeed. But there are definitely benefits that you get from it. You can get those benefits, like I was saying, from other people in your network. And um, so incubators can be really helpful. But certainly, don't feel like if you don't get into one or don't get accepted by one, that you know you can't build a like very profitable, successful business. Okay. Thanks. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit, and I have a. Uh a question on basically, we, we know that developers are kind of in high demand. It's a good market out there if you're looking for work in the coding industry. There's obviously a lot of big corporations looking for developers, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, those kind of groups. What is like the, not necessarily just that, what is the biggest offer or thing that you guys had to turn away from when you went to go do a startup? Is there, is there something you had to turn down or things that you chose to do and, uh, that you would have done if you hadn't gone into the startup route? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's different benefits that you get from working at a startup and like a mature, established company. So I think, you know, for everybody, you need to do what's best for you and decide what you are most interested in doing. Um, you know, I don't think you're going to like limit your career in any significant way. So if you want to work a few years for like a more established business and then like try a startup, you know, that's all right. And, you know, I think you're going to have a lot of options in your career. Um, the market is, you know, always in high demand for software developers, I think right now and for the foreseeable future. So, you know, I think you can find actually startups that, you know, are doing pretty well and building a profitable business. So it's not like you have to eat ramen noodles for like three years if you want to do a startup. Um, you know, at Braintree, like we cared very much and still do about just hiring and building out the best dev team that we could. So even though, you know, we were a very small team, fewer than 10 people, um, we found a way to be profitable. We decided that, you know, best engineers should have like great benefits and a good salary and things like that. So, you know, I think if, if that's what you are looking for, um, you know, we had benefits, we had, we gave people vacation, um, great salaries. So, you know, don't, don't think that like your only option for a startup, I guess, is a total famine. So, uh, so the question was, uh, what was the question one more time? Do we have to? Uh, the question is uh, basically what 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 did you turn away from when you went to go the startup route? What was the, uh, the any offers or any sort of work you would would have rather do if you weren't in the startup uh, industry? So I um I had an industry situation where what what I what people could say I turned away from was was this was school. Um, so I uh, I went here for one year, and then following that I'm on leave of absence or pausing um, from 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 university, um, so I know the University of Illinois does not like when I say this, but but startups or you know if, if your project is is considered you know once in a lifetime opportunity um, or something of that nature, um, I say go and do it because university will always be here. You can always come back to school, um, but I do see the, the the value in education and the value of of, of, of this network, but. In short, what I had to turn away from was was the University of Illinois was school. Um, for me, I mean, I had worked at a big company before, so I'd already been there and done that, it felt like. I, I didn't really feel like I was missing a whole lot in starting a company. I think the one thing potentially I missed out on was um, right before I started this company, there was a fair amount of international travel in my job, and that's always fun when you're younger. You can travel and travel the world on someone else's dime. Um, but, you know, I think the way I looked at it is some of what you were saying is there's a very finite period of time in your life, I think, where you can dedicate all of your time on building a company. And it's really awesome to take advantage of that now while you can. And then later on in life, you can, you know, travel to your heart's content. So that's the way I looked at it. Uh, yeah. Um, so I definitely turned down a job to do this latest startup. Um, and I think what's interesting is 
I think, I think I think whether or not you turn down a really good, you know, what is the offer, what are the numbers involved, that's obviously very important. But um, I think a lot of it has to do with your risk aversion or your risk tolerance. Um, you know, my it was interesting to see the reactions of people when I told them I was not taking this pretty lucrative job offer in order to spend a, spend a bunch of time making no money. Um, so yeah, that's like the simple answer to the question is yes, I did turn down a job offer. Um, and the guys I'm working with did too. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think the reason you would choose a startup, I think that's the root of the question is like, why would you, why would you, why would you turn down a great offer to do this risky thing? And I think it's totally about the risk. Um, I tend to look at things in terms of risk. Um, you could even ask, why did I even interview at that place? I don't know. Safety net? Um, yeah, I don't know. Thanks. Uh, so I have actually several uh, people asking, what is the biggest obstacle you guys overcame and the biggest challenge to doing a startup? And you know, how did you overcome that? The biggest challenge to starting it or in the, uh, in the course of the? In the course of it, the biggest challenge you encountered or uh, problem with doing your startups? Um, I mean, personally, working with great people is, is hard because everybody is opinionated. Um, I'm sure the ones of you who know me and know I'm also very opinionated. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, that's, the guts of it is like, if, you want, if, you, if you're working with great people, you want to make the best thing possible, the best possible product of the, of the highest quality. And if any, it's, it's good that everybody has an opinion. And I think the biggest challenge is sometimes those, those, those arguments can get pretty heated. Um, and if you're, you're working with these people day after day after day, and you're friends with them, but you really disagree on these points, and how do you resolve that? It's a, it's a total communication thing. It has nothing to do with code. It has nothing to do with business or numbers. It's, it's like communicating with other human beings. Um, I'm constantly learning about that, you know, about, about my friends and coworkers and myself. Like, how, how, do I, how do I get this thing that's in my head? You know, everybody here has been in an argument where they know they're right, right? Um, and to them it's obvious, but it's, that's not the case with uh, human connections and communication. So I think that's definitely the, the hardest part for me. It's not the code. Um, the one thing we had was actually as a product challenge. I think more and more you see nowadays that a lot of startups are being built on top of existing platforms like Facebook, like Apple. Um, we actually decided to build a social task app uh, for Google Apps and we were super passionate about it. We thought there was a huge opportunity. We built it, took a few months building it, and then right just as we launched it, Google launched their Google Tasks gadget and there was like panic in the room and f complete freak out. Um, but I think you know the one thing we saw that was that they're Google and they're an amazing company and they've got this really powerful platform with all these products, but they're just not going to invest the time and effort to build out social tasks the way we think it should be done. And so we just sort of doubled down on our vision and our, our passion and just really invested in that one feature. So like to, Google, to a big company like Google, it was just a feature, but to us it was like our entire business and to our customers it was like an entire product. Um, so just sort of doubling down on that and sort of having faith in our vision um, sort of got us through that and that helped a lot. So I think uh, one of our challenges right now, and it's one of probably everyone sitting down right here and almost everyone in Silicon Valley, and that's, that's hiring. It's if you want to work with, with, with really, really smart people, really, really smart people aren't usually looking for jobs. Um, and really, really smart people are either... Um, preoccupied working on their own projects or, or, or working for, for, for somebody else. And, and because, you know, even though there's 10% there's unemployment in America and Silicon Valley, hiring is, 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 is really, really challenging. Um, two engineers out of, out of any engineering school could almost go to Silicon Valley and, and raise capital. So, so hiring has been really uh, 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 challenging. I mean, it's, it's, it'd be easy to pick up just random people, but if you want to work with the best people, that's uh, uh, been one of our biggest challenges right now. One obstacle for us at Braintree, and certainly an obstacle that you ever can overcome, is competing with bigger companies. Um, I mean, just like Amit was saying about uh, competing with Google, you know, for us at Braintree, um, our competitors are billion dollar companies like PayPal, Authorize.net. And, um, you know, just thinking about, like, can we compete with them, I think can be kind of a daunting thing to think about. And, 
you know, really for us, we were able to build a better product. We were able to provide better service than some of these very large competitors. So certainly if you guys are thinking about starting a startup and, you know, there's something that you realize that you think like, hey, we could do this better. Like there's, there's this product in the market that could be done better. Um, you know, don't be scared off by the size of your competitors. Um, even for us, you know, we kind of thought like, what company is going to trust their credit card processing to, you know, this little 10 person startup. But um, companies want good service, they want a good product to use, and you know, you can beat bigger competitors out there. All right, thanks. Uh, a lot of people like to talk about, you know, how to choose a co-founder, how to choose a technical co-founder or business co-founder. Do you guys think there's any merit to those kind of um, guides to choosing a founder? And is there an ideal number of co-founders? Is there, is there a certain metric that you would look for when starting a startup? So I think more than one is good. Having a co-founder is a, a very good thing. Um, I, know, I guess I'm interested in seeing if Dave uh, makes another dating analogy when the mic gets to the end of the line again. Um, I mean, I do think for a co-founder, you want somebody that um, is going to kind of have the same ideas as you, the same like desires for like building the company. You know, that is going to iterate and evolve over time, but you want somebody who is somewhat like-minded, but yet also maybe different enough that you get like a good mix of like ideas and debates and different ideas coming into play. So, you know, I think look to start a company with somebody that you know well, somebody that, you know, you're confident that you can work in and that you kind of have the same ideas and passions for what you want to go do, but is different enough to have a good mix of ideas. I would, I would agree with that. I think, you know, in short, having two to three co-founders is, is, is the right number. Um, and in order to, to uh, find them, I think uh, uh, it's going to be very, very challenging to find someone outside of your network. Um, it's probably, you know, someone you already know, someone that you're uh, in class with, someone that, you know, you, you're, you're, you're friends with right now. Um, and, and similar to what he said, you know, co-founders should be like-minded, same values, but but very comp, uh, complementary skill sets. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think if you're, uh, uh, you'll find much success if you're looking for a co-founder. That person's probably already already in your network right now. I totally agree. The only thing I'd add is um, try to find someone who not only is complementary in terms of skill sets, but complementary in terms of a temperament. So if you're a very deliberative slow person who likes to think about things a lot, I think it's really useful to have a co-founder who's a little bit reckless um, because then hopefully you'll balance out and you'll figure, you'll come to the sort of the best medium. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything. <laughs> I try, I've been sitting here trying to think of a dating analogy and I can't think of a good one, so sorry. But, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe marriage or something, I don't know. Um, but I think, at least from my personal experience, like. I, I haven't had the experience of like, okay, I need to find a co-founder now. That was never my experience. My experience has always been very organic. It's always been very, oh, you know, I'm working on this thing idly, and it looks like it might have some, some momentum to it, uh, you know, and somebody will say, oh, that, that looks interesting, and then you, you sort of talk about it at the bar, or, you know, wherever you are, and then, it, I don't know, it sort of grows naturally, and I think, um, yeah, I don't know, that's, that's been my experience, so I guess I can't, I guess I can't speak to if you want to, oh, yeah, I want you, I want you. Uh, that that to me sounds like hiring, um, which is hard. So, <laughs> I think I think the best thing to do is to look at the look at the examples you have before you. You know, um, for example, Dropbox. They didn't know each other before they were co-founders, and it totally worked. Um, so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a terrible answer, but <laughs> thanks. Earlier we talked a little bit about competing with larger companies and uh, what's that what that is like, um, and obviously that's very frustrating when like Google comes out with the Google Tasks app, right, when you launch uh, do.com. But what do, you, what do you think that if there ever was a point in the past when you were working on your projects where you were ready to quit, did that, did that ever occur? And if so, how did you get past that point? Um, yeah. <laughs> so... I think startups, I think one of the things that differs between large companies and startups is uh, the, uh, what's the, the height of like, so I think things are sort of cyclic, right? You have highs and you have lows in your daily lives. And um, at, a, at a large company, they're sort of long and shallow. Uh, but with startups, they're very, you know, one day you're like, oh, hell yeah, we just, we just 
you know, we got a $250,000 investment. <laughs> it's crazy awesome, and it's an incredible high. And then the next day, the next day, you're just like, oh, my God, this isn't going to work. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> so how to push through that? I don't know. It's hard. It's, it's very hard. I think, that's, I think that's one of the hardest parts is sort of zooming out, and at least for me, is seeing it that way and trying to just view these things for what they are. Bad things happen. Good things happen. And uh, you just got to sort of stick through it. And you know, I'm going to steal Gary Tan's thing again. He said, uh, if, if, it, if it continues to be low, 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 and it, you, it's been a long time since you've experienced one of those really awesome highs, you know, don't be a damn fool. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's, that's very subjective. So... Um, I think quitting in the startup world is usually synonymous with running out of money or missing, you don't have enough runway anymore. I think if you're super passionate about the idea and you have got a really good understanding of what the users want and what the market needs, you're probably not going to quit. You're just going to keep barreling through. The only thing that will actually stop you if you have passion is just running out of cash in the bank. And that's the only thing that we really thought about. Um, because we were pretty confident that we knew what these users wanted and that we were probably the best equipped to build that. So. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, what, what he said, startups are like this, that's, that's very true. I don't know if Gary yesterday spoke about Airbnb with their had a, like, trough of sorrow, where literally for two years they, they didn't have any money and they were selling cereal boxes to, to survive. And, um, uh, you know, the only real way to, 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 to lose is to give up. You know, Twitter for the first two years of their existence had 2,400 users. And that's it. Like, I have 2,400, you know, friends on Facebook or followers on Twitter, and that's, that's how many users Twitter had for the first two years of their existence. Any, any normal person or investor would have said at that time, like, you know, maybe you should try something different. But they, um, they kept going. So I think the, the, the only way to truly lose is just to, to stop what you're doing. But if you're really passionate about um, uh, what you're doing, uh, you know, there's, there's no real way to lose. I think hopefully for most of you, if you're looking at joining or starting a business, um, you won't get to the point where, you know, you just feel like you're not going to make it with the business as a whole. There might be like certain ideas where, you know, you try something with your product and it doesn't work well, but I think you have a big opportunity to, you know, go out there and like talk to people whose problems you're going to be solving. And if you're solving a problem for somebody um, and providing value to them, they're going to pay you for your product and help you build out your business. If you know you've spent a year working on something and you haven't talked to a single person who's interested in using it, then you know I, I think you're going to have a lot tr of trouble maintaining en enthusiasm and momentum. But you know, if, if you're talking to users and you have customers telling you how excited they are to be using your product, how you're making your li their lives better, then you know I think that's going to keep you going. And you know, there might be points where, like, actually, you know, like the Twitter story, rolling that out like takes a while, um, or the Airbnb story, where you know it's it takes you a while to get momentum. But you know, just just make sure you're getting some validation for your idea, and I think that can keep you going. Thanks. Um, this is a really good question. Uh, if you're interested in working for a startup but not necessarily founding, is it a good idea? Because it seems kind of like a lot of risk without as much reward. I think, again, it all depends on what you're looking for um, and, you know, what you want to do, like, in your career with your life. Um, working for a startup, you have a great opportunity, I think, to watch a business grow and be a part of that and, you know, have a, a good learning experience from that. And, again, I mean, not all startups, you know, mean, like... Um, like sacrificing, you know, like a big amount of like salary or something like that. You, you know, you can find companies where you're going to have a great learning opportunity, possibly in startups. You know, get get some equity, and um, just learn how to grow a business, and then you know, use that experience to possibly start something of your own. So I think it just really depends what you're looking for and what you want to do. And you know, both there's no like one right path for somebody that's interested in doing something like this. I mean, I think for for the, the early employees, I mean, if you're doing it for the money, you're, you're, you're not going to enjoy it. Since a, uh, uh, To be a part of a startup early on, um, everyone is, is emotionally attached. Where, you know, Sunday night at 2 in the morning, if you walk into startup's office, there are probably most people there. And, um, uh, you know, the, 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 an, you know, an analogy is you want to be a, a, a big fish in a small pond or a 
or a small fish in a big pond? you want to work for Google and maintain code, or you want to work for a startup and actually create something? Um, so it's, uh, 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 I think it's ex extremely valuable to, to join an early stage startup, especially now when, when you're able to take that risk and you're able to, to you, know, you don't have to support a family right now, and, and, and this is the time to, to do it. Uh, the one quick thing I would add is um, I like the idea of joining a startup to get some experience, but I think the most important thing is startups generally have super smart people, and those are super smart people that you can then go and start another business with later. And you'll sort of know how each other works, what each person's good at, what they're not so good at, and you can sort of help each other out. Because um, when we started our company, the four of us actually came from another startup. And so it was just we didn't have to spend that time figuring that out. So I think that's super helpful. Yeah, I don't have much to add to their answers. I would just say that uh, it depends on your risk tolerance, right? Um, but I do know that I do know that um, you can learn a lot at large companies, and you can learn a lot at startups, and they're not necessarily the same kinds of things that you would learn. Um, I think I think you probably learn more about how to handle stress if you join a startup, which who knows if that's more valuable or not, depending on what you want to do after that. So I don't know. It's there's definitely no right answer <laughs> at all. So Dave, other than your previous dating advice, is there a lot of politics involved in the whole startup uh, course of making your startup either in founding or in launching your product or in just the general business sense? Or there, is there red tape to cut through? Oh, no, it's wonderful. It's 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 arguably one of the best things about working in a small team like that. Is all right. I want to I want to build this feature. I want I want to make it so that block students can Skype in the browser or something or like that. You just okay, just do it. Whereas like if you work for a large company, it, you got to maybe get permission and how can you spend your time and you know how you then are you going to do marketing? How are you going to spend the money? You're going to market it. Uh, I just talked to someone earlier who's working at a at a company and um, she built this awesome feature and nobody knows about it and it's a shame. It's a damn shame. But when you're working in a startup, you just do it. You're just like, "Oh, all right." Yeah, let's let's uh, ramp up our ad spend for this thing, and then you can just do it. Um, so no, there's there's no red tape. It's wonderful. It's incredibly liberating. <laughs> yeah, it's a purest form of business and building a product. There's there's no red tape. There will be red tape as you scale and as you sort of have legacy code and legacy customers and legacy products. But those are really good problems to have uh, compared to the alternative. Yeah, I have nothing to add. I agree. Yeah, for Braintree, um, you know, we did have we had to become a level one PCI compliant service provider, and that um, you know, felt like some kind of red tape to get through as a business. But you know, we were able to go through that process despite being a smart uh, small company. And then you know, also like I think there's a good business opportunity to uh, maybe solve some red tape for other businesses. Um, like a big part of what Braintree does is allow our customers to handle credit card data securely, so that they don't have to go through like PCI compliance and uh, that sort of thing. Thanks. Um Earlier, you mentioned uh, we, we talked a little bit about how you have to do a little bit of, of business in a sense in order to connect with people and get some publicity. Because if no one knows about your product, then what's the what's the point? How how do you go about doing that? How do you get the pu publicity you need? Uh, is it is it all ad spend or is there is it networking? Where, where's the main outlet for that? Uh, for Braintree, it was primarily through word of mouth. Um, you do need to promote your product. At the same time, if uh, I think I said this before, but if you're building a good product and you are providing value to people and solving their problems, they're going to tell other people about your product. So I think word of mouth is just absolutely one of the best forms of marketing that you can get. And then, you know, it, it's good to do a little self-promotion. You know, don't worry about going to um, networks like Hacker News or other, like, online forums and just telling people about your, your product, telling them what you're doing. You know, have a small company blog where you talk about some of the challenges you're overcoming and other people will be interested in that and learn about you, you and your product that way. I think it's, it's, it's important to, to not set expectations high. So if you, you know, do a big launch or do a... Uh, uh, a whole lot of press around your product. You're essentially manufacturing growth or manufacturing users. But if you're building something for the for the long run, that 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 won't last. Um, so you know, word of mouth, gen genuine, uh, 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 making it more genuine is always is always better. Um, so yeah, in short, you know, people never meet high expectations. I think. I think it was Mark Zuckerberg who said uh, a week before they announced the new chat, which got a lot of hate, that, that Facebook was about to release the best product ever. 
and it was it was chat, and they got so much hate in the press after after he said that, and that was you know setting expectations high and, and never meeting them. So um, you know, I'd much rather be the the person no one's heard of than uh, versus the person with the very very high expectations. Uh, one thing we did is we intentionally avoided the uh, tech crunches and Mashables and Venture Beats and all the large blogs um, when we released. We really didn't even believe in launches. Our idea was let's build a product that we ourselves could use. Let's build a product that ourselves and our advisors and our friends could use. And then we actually proceeded to sort of send an email to everyone in our address book saying, hey, we're building this product. We'd love to get feedback. And I sent it to about 1,500 people. Um, and about 100 people came back and said, this is the best thing since sliced bread. I've used a ton of other tasks app. I love this one. And of those 100 people, I don't think a, any one of them I had met more than once in my life. And then we sort of looked at those 100 people and sort of defined sort of what, what do they all have in common. And we found out where those kind of people hung out online. And they hang out in, at a lot of these sort of smaller blogs and news groups and stuff. So we went to those sites and said, hey, we're building this product. We'd love to get feedback from you. And so that got us from like 100 users into like the thousands of users. And then we just spent a lot of time instrumenting the app and building a lot of virality into it to sort of get the word of mouth and optimize for word of mouth. Yeah, so the, the question was, how do you, how do you get publicity? Uh, and I think it depends on what, what you want the publicity for. And I think the obvious is, well, you want users or you want customers. But there are other reasons for publicity. Um, for example, building a brand, you know. So, so one thing we do at Block is we just use paid advertising. You literally pay Google or the Next Web or whoever's running ad networks, or maybe even directly with other websites. You say, all right, you know, I'll give you a dollar for every click, um, and then it turns out that oh well, maybe it costs you two hundred dollars to get one person to sign up. So that's your cost of acquiring a customer. Um, if your product costs less than two hundred dollars, you don't have a business. Um, one thing you can do to to get press in maybe newspapers, which is sort of the old fashioned media, but still very, very effective, is to write the article for them and send it to the most junior journalist there. Um, that totally works. Um, yeah, but things like, things like brand, building brand, and it's interesting because social, so I worked at an analytics company for a while called Contagion, a social gaming analytics company. Um, and the social gaming industry has this down because they don't need, I mean, they need publicity up front to get, to get users. But once you have a, a first spike of users in a social game, it's like, so the first part of the funnel is customer acquisition. And there's nothing about the brand. The brand is sort of zoom out. The whole company has a brand and products have customer acquisition strategies. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I could talk about it forever. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. Um, so if, if you are working in your product and like that's in the startup, once you start your startup, you want to like keep focus on the product, you want to get that done, but obviously more things need to happen if you're building a web service, you need some sort of infrastructure, that sort of thing, which is part of the product, but it's not the primary focus. Things like security, things like just general uh, infrastructure in terms of setting up domain names, I, that, I mean that's easy enough, but how much time do you guys spend doing that? Is that a, is that a big concern, like, like the security aspect of things? Or? Yes, it's a big concern, but it's not the only big concern, which is a cop-out answer. But um, so some, a, a lot of people would advise saying, well, deal with the problems when they arise, sort of ask forgiveness, not permission, um, which I personally, I use that phrase all the time. Um, but, but you can't always do that. Um, for example, the privacy of your customer's credit card information. You can't wait until that becomes a problem. To, to, to build infrastructure around that, so um, I think I think if if you need like a yardstick or, or like a you know a, a concrete oh well you should deal with this but not this this but not this sorry uh, I think I think a good heuristic is you know um, cust customer privacy especially yeah customer privacy is I think the biggest the biggest security issue uh, one thing Block does for instance is uh, the first uh, the first part of the curriculum of Block is um, Ruby you learn Ruby and we don't have you do that on your own machine. We have you do it in the browser um, for various reasons. Uh, but one thing we talked a lot about is how do you need the Ruby that's running in the browser sandbox to be secure? Um, and it turns out that that hasn't been a problem. Um, you know, will somebody fork bomb our server? 
For, so we, we evaluate the Ruby on the server and send it back to the browser because there's a memory leak in the JS implementation of Ruby. Um, and so, well, they could fork bomb your server if they just write some malicious Ruby. Um, and I think Steve Huffman from Reddit said it really well in this particular kind of case. He says, well, if it fails, let it fail and restart it. Just let it fail quickly and restart it. And that, so far, has been a totally fine solution um, that wasn't intuitive at the beginning. So. Uh, one advantage that all startups have is that no one knows who you are and no one cares if you go down and you should use that to your advantage. Um, so when we were starting, um, you know, I think if Facebook's not sending out emails, everyone knows about it in a split second. But in our app, when we first started, we were like, well, do we need multiple mail servers and multiple data centers? We're like, well, we have no users, so let's just spend the time on one mail server. So it's sort of like what you're saying, you just do the bare minimum to get by. There's some stuff you can't sacrifice on, like customer data and data integrity and billing information, but things like uptime and stuff, you just sort of deal with it as it comes along. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on, on how, how time sensitive the issue is. Every, um, every Sunday night we have one team meeting and we force it uh, with allowing everyone 10 minutes to talk and then also taking care of things very quickly. So we compress it all and then uh, uh, give ourselves, you know, if it's not a time sensitive issue, give ourselves that time to do it. And then if it is time sensitive, we, we do it right on the spot. So. Yeah, I think if you wait till things are perfect, you're probably never going to launch. Um, so, you know, it's not really realistic for you to say, like, before you launch this product that, you know, you're going to have an infrastructure like Braintree's that is, you know, super secure, really highly available, you know, redundancy and automated failover everywhere. You know, I think it's good advice to, yeah, maybe, you know, in the early days, if something fails, you're going to have to manually take some action to get it spun back up, and that's totally reasonable. At the same time, like, you want to have... Um, you want to take the privacy of your customer's data very secure and, you know, make sure that that's not going to be an issue for your startup when it launches. And you just kind of want to have, like, good company hygiene. I mean, like, I can I could save 10 minutes every day if I just didn't take a shower. But, like, in the long run, like, it's not going to be that great for me. So, you know, you don't want to take, like, too many shortcuts with your startup. You want to do things right. But, like, don't, don't worry about making it perfect uh, before you get out there and you actually launch. All right. Thanks. Um, everyone, uh, we have about 15 companies here today at the Startup Fair. It'll be at 1 p.m. Feel free to stop on by. Uh, I think most of them are hiring. They're looking for good people. So stop on by. Uh, bring your resume if you have it. Love to see you there. Uh, we're going to go ahead and break. Uh, if you have a meal ticket, I think lunch is starting soon. So please stop on by. Thanks for coming, guys. <laughs>